Welcome everyone to Coaching in Session. My name is Michael Reardon and I'll be your mindset coach today. And today we're going to be having on a former educator who's now in the leadership role of helping teachers get into a better type of mindset. And it's similar to something I do in the sense of I don't just work with teachers primarily or new leaders. I work with the world. No matter what profession you have, what career, what type of background, I am going to work with you to help you get into a better mindset to be more mindful. And what my guest Robin Wilson does is she helps teachers, helps leaders become more mindful and more aware of what they do in the classroom and in their own personal lives. Because if we think about what a teacher is, a teacher is just a human too, but they have to show up every single day and they have to be able to be effective, giving 100% or just learning that they're not at 100% today and how can they get back to 100%. So having that grace, having that type of appreciation for how we are as humans and then how we develop. So before we get into that conversation with Robin Wilson and myself, make sure to like, comment, subscribe, and to share this video in their audio so we can help bring awareness about all the work that teachers do. And if you're a teacher or if you're a parent, just understanding that your work is appreciated because yes, we understand that teaching is not an easy career and the pandemic and the quarantine has proven that Teaching is not just a glorified babysitter. So let's get into all about mindfulness and leadership with Robin Wilson. Welcome, Robin Wilson, to Coaching the Session. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you so much for coming on. So you have a background in leadership, coaching, And you currently do a lot of work with mindfulness training. So in your own words, can you please tell the world who you are and what you do? Absolutely. Um, I think for me, I still think of myself as the fifth grade teacher I was many, many years ago, uh, which is what propelled me on the path that I am today. Um, And over a couple of decades of work with training and coaching, particularly in the education space, I found myself connecting with the world of mindfulness uh, when I was working in a leadership position in a large urban school district. And it helped to transform the way I thought about the work I was doing as a leader and also how I engaged with those that I was leading. And so As a result of that work, I have found myself really not only enhancing my own mindfulness practice, but helping other leaders think about how being mindful can really be a game changer in how they lead and relate to and connect, uh, not just with those they lead, but those in their lives holistically. You probably get this question asked a lot. I know I get this question asked a lot when they ask like, well, why not teaching still, right? Like, why are you doing the training stuff now? more so than being a teacher. So I think that's an important question to ask because teaching is a wonderful job, you know, intrinsically fulfilling. Every day I loved going in when I was a teacher, but there was something more that I was looking for. So I'm not sure if you had that experience also, or if there was maybe an ulterior motive. No. So I think for me, I still see the work I do as teaching, right? I'm just teaching different people. And Instead of teaching 11-year-olds, I'm helping uh, leaders. And for me, um, I spent about a decade in the classroom and found myself questioning and wondering how I could more so impact the field and the education. And so I went back and got my doctorate and became a trainer of teachers. And over time, really deeply invested and saw that I could have a greater impact by not just impacting 25 students in my own classroom, but training hundreds of teachers who would then go on to impact hundreds of children. And so um, have done that. And I tell people all the time, I think I've done just about every role that there is that touches K to 12 education. And so I'm really proud of that. And as I made my own shift out of the classroom and into leadership, I recognized how essential effective leaders are to the work that happens in the classroom. So being able to deeply invest in leaders, not just in the K-12 space, but in the nonprofit space and corporate space holistically, I think benefits children and education in the long run. So for me, it's not a step away from, it's a different way to impact. You probably know being a teacher for 10 years plus, what makes a good teacher? And it's not so much of showing up to school with your lesson plans and then just reading off your lesson plans or following the curriculum. There's so much more to being a good teacher. 
And I'm sure you experienced this with your trainees, your teachers who come and they get training from you. They are asking, well, what makes a good teacher per se, or how can I be a more effective teacher? What is maybe one of the most common things or threads that you can tell people to be better teachers in the realm of any grade, any generation, just what makes a good teacher? Yeah, so I think it's it's really interesting. And that's why I don't see my work as a huge leap from being a teacher. I think in all the work that we do, it's about people, right? It comes down to, and I think what the best teachers I've seen and worked with are very aware that they don't teach content, they teach people, mm-hmm. right? And so it is really about having a deep sense of connection that this work, the choices that you make, the decisions that you make, impact individual people, um, regardless of the age. And and that's why I think it was so important for me to get into the work with leaders who lead teachers to help them understand that you don't just lead a school, you lead people. And I would say teachers that are extremely effective see themselves as leaders, right? They are casting a vision for what is possible for the group of people that they are responsible for, um, that they're stewarding. And so whether they be five or whether they be 55, as a leader, when you bring your authentic self and your presence, and I think that's where mindfulness connects to this work, uh, when you bring all of that to a classroom, to a boardroom, to wherever you are, you're going to show up as a better version of yourself and able to give and support and and really be the best for the people you're serving. So I would say for me, those best teachers are keenly aware that they're leaders and they're aware that the work they do is people work. This morning when I was at the gym, I was just thinking about my first day of teaching where I was in the classroom and I'm like, what the heck do I do? I went to college. I got all this information on, you know, like basically the materials and the knowledge to teach, but how in the world do you be a teacher? And I just remember the first day I was a little nervous and I was like, all right, these all this, you know, all these things running in my mind, are they gonna like me? That doesn't matter. And then am I am I gonna mess up? But you know, it's too late for that now. So it's just all of this, like my mind is racing. And I would say after a couple of months, I felt more natural. And after the first year, it was kind of like a walk in the park where I would walk into the classroom and it's ready for business almost. And that way of uh, operating in the beginning where you're a little bit nervous and you're trying to get your feet wet. Many new teachers go into teaching just like that. They are like, okay, well, you know, I don't want to mess up, even though I went to school and everything. School doesn't necessarily prepare teachers to be teachers. It's kind of like on the job experience where if a kid, you know, spills the milk, what do you do? We don't learn that in college. We learn that in the classroom. So kind of like going into the realm of how can you train teachers to get the on-job experience without getting the on-job experience, if that makes any sense. Yeah. And, you know, I think I've had the opportunity in my career um, to work deeply in teacher preparation. Um, And I think we know some things about what does help prepare teachers for teaching. And across the country, um, there's been a movement well over the last decade to think about and ask those questions. And I think experience nothing trumps that, right? Mm -hmm. So there's the what you're going to learn about pedagogy in a university setting, which is vital and important, but it's getting in the classroom, getting those kind of at-bats, if you will. Um, If you think about about sports, right? You, You don't just sit and listen to someone tell you how to be a better pitcher. The way you become a better pitcher is you go and you pitch. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I think the more opportunities and at-bats that we can give folks that are looking to really be successful in the classroom and doing that alongside highly qualified, highly experienced um, teachers who can be there as a coach along the side to say to them, give it a try. Now let's reflect. And what did you learn from that? And what can you do differently tomorrow, right? Mm -hmm. Or next class period. If you're a high school, middle school teacher, you get a next class period all the time. And so I think it is really giving those opportunities to get in the classroom, but doing it alongside someone who can can help you be reflective, to be metacognitive, to really think about what you're doing is what is the key to helping someone 
be successful, right? So that first year, you said you learned a lot and you were much more confident in the second year. But man, imagine how much more that would have been if you had had a sage, really highly qualified person who could coach you alongside and be in the space with you. So when the child spilled the milk and then you made a decision on how to deal with that, they could come back and reflect with you about what might have been different if you had handled it a different way to accelerate your own learning and your own craft as a teacher. When I was starting teaching before I was a teacher as a swim coach, so I had a good amount of experience dealing with those mishaps during lessons, during sessions. When I went into school and I was doing my student teaching everything, I had classroom management down packed. That was easy because I already had some knowledge before I went into the classroom, but I still had to learn all the knowledge. I was doing music. Then I switched over to special ed later, but I was doing music. So I had to make sure I knew everything and then relay the information that I knew to them in a way that they would understand it. So it was kind of that transition. And the same thing happened in swimming where I knew how to swim, but how do I teach them how to swim? So it was breaking things down into palatable bites for them for the, so they can understand and they could be successful. I remember just my student teaching. High school was, because I had to do both, I had to do high school and elementary. So high school was pretty much, they're adults almost. So it's kind of like, tell them what to do. They do it. If they don't, they get graded. It was pretty straightforward. Elementary, on the other hand, is kind of like every step I'm going to walk with you versus like, all right, good luck. Whatever you do, you know, we can fix it or we can adjust. It was like, all right, breaking down every direction. So I had to learn that aspect. And I had wonderful cooperating teachers that helped me prepare myself for that first day of of class. And I remember just showing up on the first day and you're still a little nervous. You got the jitters. It's similar to public speaking, where if you public speak, you're going in front of an audience, you're going to have some type of jitter. And it's maybe not so much of like, oh my God, I'm so fearful. I'm going to go out here and mess up. It's kind of like, all right, take a deep breath and you're back in your own environment where sometimes the mind can get in our way. So that leads us to mindfulness, right? So how can we as teachers be mindful of the work that we do, that we can be knowledgeable of saying, okay, well, I'm making a difference in the world. I'm making a difference for the student and not so much of I'm just coming into work as a career where we don't make teaching a career. We make it a livelihood of we're making a difference rather than just getting a paycheck. Let's talk about how mindfulness is in the realm of teaching in the sense of a career rather than just a job. Yeah. So I think one of the things that I find is it's about moving from this place of autopilot, right? I've got my lesson plans down. I know what I need to teach. I know the content. I know the objectives. I know the standards I need students to meet. But it really is being aware and fully present in the moments that you're with students and even aware before you come into that, right? Where are you as you're walking into the space? Are you stressed? Are you tense? Are you anxious? What you know about being a teacher is, and it's with any profession, right? Your private life still shows up. Like whatever stressor you had before you walked into the classroom, the stressor is still there. So then being aware in those moments of how is this stressor impacting how I engage with my students, how I relate to my students, and then being aware of what's going on with your students, being fully present in the moment, not ruminating on what didn't work yesterday, uh, what didn't even work last period, but really looking at in the moment, what does each student need? What does our collective classroom group need? And staying aware so that we just don't move through the motions and be in that space of like, well, we're just going to get this done. We're checking off boxes. But it's really understanding, as you said, breaking it down, right? And knowing what does breaking it down look like for this student as opposed to what it looks like for another student. And I think mindfulness, that awareness, self-awareness as a starting point is really crucial to then working with our students, to supporting our students, to understanding what am I bringing in in terms of my attitude, in terms of what I'm paying attention to, um, and being aware of, am I being open to the possibilities of what each day, each class period, each moment brings, or am I so focused on This is the outcome. This is what I need to get accomplished that we miss the bigger picture and miss the opportunities to really um, connect and be fully aware and fully present. And then that goes into the 
mentality of survival mode where we have our own problems, we have our own family issues, our own life, and we're thinking about it. Then we go into school and we try to not give 100% because we don't have 100% because we have 50% back at the home that we're dealing with. So we don't show up sometimes at school. Teachers sometimes might not show up just because of all the world problems. Mm -hmm. So they say, well, how can I do the minimal amount of work and barely get by? Maybe they're a teacher who likes packets. So I'm gonna give the kids a bunch of packets and they say, okay, everyone read your packets and, you know, we'll figure it out. Not showing up, right. Giving hundred percent. And I, and I'll give you an example. One day I, I wasn't feeling good when I was, uh, it was on a Tuesday. I wasn't feeling good. And I was went to school and I asked the secretary, I was like, do you have any subs that can take over my class? She goes, no, I said, great. And then, so I was like, all right, well, you know, like what, like, what are the options? She goes, well, if you leave, then you can go home, of course, but you know, there's going to be no music or whatever. And I was like, oh, well, you know, I can't have that. So I was like, all right, let me give 40%, 50%. Right. So I gave 40%, 50%. And my first class is a kindergarten class should be a piece of cake, right? They're kindergartners, right? Play some music. They dance easy. No, it was not. I was 40%, 50% and they could read me like a book. They're like, oh, he's not hundred percent today. So we're going to try to make his life H E double L. And so I said, all right, this is not working out. They're running around. They were misbehaving. And I was like, this never happens. So I was like, all right, let's do hundred percent. As soon as I did hundred percent, I already switched in my mind hundred percent. Boom, easy, full control. And then I was like, I have to give hundred percent. So I woke up at that moment and I can't remember a day after that, that I didn't give hundred percent. How can we help teachers get into that mindset or be more mindful of giving their all every single day, even though they have so much outside circumstances that it's their personal life show up still when they go into school? So I think a couple of things, right? You know this from your own experience. Teaching is not easy. It is um, an amazing, I, I have so much respect for my colleagues in the profession and the work that they do and the selfless ways that they do give, right? Because when I think about many other professions, if you don't feel 100%, you feel 40%, you call off work, your email backlogs on you, you may have to cancel a few meetings. In your case, as a music teacher, you know, in, a, in one day in an elementary school alone, you would see over 100 kids. So they're not 100 children. And depending on you, if you are, say, in a different realm where you can just put your out of office on, on your email and things back up, but nothing happens. Well, in teaching, there has to be a human to take another human's place, right? This is people work. So it is, a, it is a hard decision for teachers. And I think one of the things that I always encourage teachers to do is, yes, give 100%, but also give yourself grace. Like it's, it's okay to be mindful and be aware of, I don't have 100% to give. I'm going to still be here, right? You left your students still even at 50% was better than you not being there. Um, it was hard and things got better for you the more effort you put into it. But I think we just have to be honest, like some days in the work teachers do, that's really tough. And it's not that teachers are lazy or don't want to give 100%. It's a hard place to be. And so I think the first thing I always say is like, give themselves grace that they are human. They're not superhuman. And then I also say, though, if your MO is to only give 40% every day, then, then it may be time to consider and really think, is this the profession for me? Because it is a profession that requires a lot, a lot, a lot of effort. Um, but I'm, all, I'm a big champion for teachers and the need for their self-care and their mental health, and particularly after the last two years, right? Mm -hmm. They you know, teachers are working in spaces in ways that most of them never trained to do. Most of them never trained to teach 100% virtually, and they had to figure it out. Um, most of them never trained to teach 100% virtually from their homes with their own children in the background. So I'm big on reminding teachers and school leaders and people in general, like, be mindful and aware that you're not at 100%. Own that. Be curious about is this just a today thing and it's because I don't feel well that I'm not 100% or 
Or am I finding myself constantly not at 100%? And maybe it's time for me to think about doing something different. So I think mindfulness allows us to really create that sense of awareness and curiosity about why I'm not 100% without judgment, right? It's It could be a multitude of reasons why I'm not at 100%. Being mindful helps me uncover and un- and understand that and say, oh, I'm not at 100% today because I had all of these stressors. So what do I need to do differently? How can I be different? Is it, I do need to talk and figure out how we're going to have a sub for music for a couple of days because I need to go physically get better? Or is it, this may just be time for me to pivot and, and go do something different because I can't be 100% in this space. And when you have that teacher who's consistently giving 40 or 50%, would that be something that someone in leadership is going to have to address? And I know it's difficult, especially when a teacher has tenured, where the teacher is going to be maybe in school for a long period of time, they're getting close to retirement, so they're just kind of winding down their years. So they might have maybe two, three years left, and they're just kind of waiting until retirement. And the principal sees, the leader sees. And they say, well, you know, like they're not as effective as they used to be, could be an age thing, you know, they're getting tired, they're getting ready to retire, but they're not showing up. So the class is suffering. Is there anything a leader or principal can do to either maybe have the teacher reconsider, maybe leaving early or to kind of say, hey, I still need you to show up for these two or three years that you're going to be a teacher? Yeah, it's funny you mentioned that because Um, I've been really fortunate. Um, I was actually just with a friend who is, I think, six months away from retirement. Like she can go out in in December. And we were laughing uh, because we began our career together a year apart from each other. We'll just say many years ago. How about that? Mm -hmm. Um, And I remember her saying like part of the reason why she knows she's close and ready to actually retire is because she's still working as hard as she was Mm -hmm. when she started many, many years ago, because she hasn't given up. And so I think sometimes that's a misnomer that the teachers who are at the end of their career work the least hard and the ones who are starting out are working the hardest. I think that's such an individual way of approaching the work. But I think as a leader, our responsibility is to understand our people, to help them see what it is and where they're being challenged and how their choices may be impacting the students, how it may be impacting the overall school culture. I would say teachers want to be teachers because they care deeply about children. Mm -hmm. And I think as a leader, it's our responsibility to work with that person, to understand where they are, to coach and support where we can, and to push and challenge where where we're needed to do that. So I don't know that there's a blanket answer to how we we address that, because I would say as a leader in my space and time that I've led in schools, I've worked with amazing teachers who were much later in their careers who could have retired and were hands down running circles around some of the newer teachers in terms of their commitment and effort and work, because I think they also understood they were coming to the end of their career and wanted to make sure that they gave the best to those children that they did in in the beginning of their career. So I think it's a leader's understanding or role to understand what's going on. And I think that's where the work that I've been doing around helping leaders um, bring mindfulness practices into their leadership skill set really gets into one of the pillars that we've developed in our program around interpersonal engagement, right? So how am I coaching people? What culture am I cultivating in the space where I'm leading? How am I listening and showing empathy uh, to those that I lead? And am I effective in casting that vision and being proactive versus reactive, right? Mm -hmm. So there's, there's that ownership that sits with the leader is that space of not just waiting and reacting to people, but being proactive in how I support and build a culture uh, within the the community I'm leading. I saw both. I saw teachers who retired on their last day. They were still giving 100%. I saw teachers who were checked out a year before. Mm -hmm. And it just depends on the person, right? So like how mindful are they? Do they, you know, see these students as people or just as, hey, you know, I have to handle my job. I have to do my business. And then when I'm all done, I'm all done. Mm -hmm. 
but that does more harm to them in the end. One ineffective teacher is going to basically put that child or the, that whole classroom behind by an, a year. If, if we if we have to think of it in the whole sense of that one teacher is not doing the utmost. So now the kids are behind. Trying to get everyone on track, saying, hey, we want everyone to, you know, be with, you know, on, on grade level where they're supposed to be. So the next year is not catch up. It's let's keep progressing. Right. So that type of progression. And one of the things I did whenever I had some free time was I would always sneak into a classroom with an effective teacher where they, their classroom management was superb. Their, you know, just their way of speech was so delightful. And I remember when I was interning in the beginning for my master's, I would always just gravitate toward teachers who had a different type of personality. There was kindergarten teachers who were like very intrinsic and they were very playful, open-minded saying, allow the kids to be free. And it seemed like chaos, but it was controlled chaos for them. And me, I was thinking like, I can do this. And then I had one teacher who was very structured. The kids knew very proper. They'll go to their desk. They'll do what they're supposed to do. And I call her sugar and spice. So when she had to be spicy, she was, but she was always so sweet. And the kids knew that. So the kids kind of, they find the personality of the teacher and they kind of mimic that. So two kindergarten classrooms where well, one was very like, okay, this is mature almost. And then one was very playful and wild, but it's still structured. Teaching is so different in the realm of you can have one teacher and have a totally different experience than if you had a different type of teacher. And then we just learn about that type of personality. Over the years of you teaching, what are some of your favorite types of personalities or favorite type of teachers that you have seen and maybe even try to mimic in your own teaching career? Yeah. So I think one of the, I would say my, my teaching career personality is probably a mix of the two teachers you just, just, just described. So mm -hmm. I think my students who I've taught over the years would say that I was a mix of both. Um, definitely there were spaces where if you came into my classroom, I was big on building autonomy in children. They're people, right? And so they learn to do the things by doing the things. And so I was big on making sure they had independence, they had responsibility. They didn't need me to guide and direct all of their movements. I wanted them to learn how to make decisions and have choices and have, um, you know, some from freedom within those choices. Mm -hmm. And, but also knowing when it's time to adjust and be very structured and, and very pulled together. I would say the teachers that I've seen that I love their style is when a teacher finds their own voice and personality in a classroom. Mm -hmm. When they come to a place where they're comfortable in their own skin and whatever that looks like, right? So if it is the more playful, um, silly classroom, that that's who they are and they bring that to a room as a way to create a classroom culture. And then there are teachers who their rooms are very quiet. They're very orderly. Doesn't mean that the students aren't having fun in their learning. It doesn't mean that they're not joyful because that teacher is being themselves. And so I can remember working with a teacher I was training whose personality and just background was very different than their mentor teacher they were training alongside. And that person kept telling me, well, I can't be Mrs. Smith. I'm not her. And mm -hmm. I would remind them, I never asked you to be Mrs. Smith, right? I need you to pay attention to what it is that Mrs. Smith does. And then how do you make that your own? How do you stand? Because it, and it actually happened to be a male um, who was saying, well, I'm not her. I'm not a woman. I can't, nobody's asking you to do that. And so I think the teachers I've always most enjoyed is when, particularly when working with newer teachers, when you kind of see them find themselves and they're like, oh, this is who I want to be. This is what I enjoy. This is what I can bring to the classroom. So I had a teacher um, that I worked with in a building who was a first year teacher who was a competitive water skier. And so she, she had skied at the collegiate level. It was a big deal for her. And so she was very competitive. She also knew how to coach people. And when she figured out how to bring that competitive spirit to the classroom and share those sides of herself with the students, that's when she began to thrive. Um, I think one of my favorite teachers I ever worked alongside 
was a 55 year old African American male who was teaching pre K, mm-hmm. um, who very much um, had this balance of what you described as sugar and spice in a classroom. And to see him dance with four year olds and them light up, and also to watch them, though, walk very professionally and calmly down a hallway was magical because, you know, you talked about kindergarten being easy. I try to avoid all people under the age of eight professionally. (laughs) Give me the older ones with a little bit of sass and I'm good. Give me the little ones. I'm a little less good. So I think for me, the, the really effective teachers in classrooms are like when they find themselves, that's when the magic happens. Mm -hmm. And that magic is, is something everyone does have to go and find themselves. And it, you know, that that's going to touch into a sense of mindfulness too, like understanding who you are as a person. Are you playful? Are you going to be maybe a little bit more strict? I found that balance in my student teaching and I found it in my swimming coaching. So from understanding how I was, I can go straight into the classroom and just be who I was versus let me figure out who I am. And like I said, I watched many, many wonderful teachers and I had many teachers like yourself, who were all done with teaching and they took that leadership role and they would mentor us, they would coach us, they would talk about their experiences. And I've, and as you were saying, kindergarten is tough. Yes, because I remember one teacher, he was saying he had a class of kindergartners and somehow a kindergartner had got his head stuck in the chair. <laughs> and, and he was very like- kindergarten. That's yeah. very kindergarten. <laughs> And then, and then, so at the time he was a substitute and, and he was saying the whole story. They had to call the janitor. The janitor had to come and cut the bar and it was a big deal. And he was like, all right, I'm not going to deal with kindergartners no more. So he found third grade to be his preferred grade. Mm-hmm. And so, te- yeah, teachers are going to have their own preference. And like, I enjoyed this age group because the mind is different and the way their mind is at that age can resonate with that teacher. So then they can feel like, oh, well, I want to give hundred percent. Because these people have mindsets or they're mindful or they're thinking in a mindful manner of how I would like to have them be or how they're thinking right now. So it just depends on the person. For me, like I said, music is K to 12. So you you do have to be able to adapt. And then, of course, if you're in a district, this all is split. You can go in middle school, which is the toughest. And and then high school, which I find to be pretty easy. Elementary, I also find to be pretty easy. It's just middle school, you have all these issues. They're a different middle schoolers are a whole different breed. And I I tell people all the time, I think the heroes of teaching are the people who can teach kindergarten and middle school. Because I would never want to do either. So yeah. yeah. Middle school, yeah. I taught middle school for I think two years. And it was like, whoa, I, I went in with the idea of I know how to teach. And then I was doing the same things I would do for elementary and it didn't work. They would give me 30 looks like I'm not a kid. And I'm like, you're right. You're not a kid. Let me adjust this. So, so it is a learning experience. And then having, you know, like a coach help people, help teachers get into the state of mind that they have to be, to be effective is going to be powerful. If you can, please share with us a few last words, and then please tell people how they can find you. Absolutely. You know, I think it all comes down to leadership for me, right? Whether you're leading a group of five-year-olds or you're leading a building full of teachers or if you're leading a corporation of executives, I think being mindful and that self-awareness and your ability to self-manage, right? I think we all, when we're our best selves, we are best at no matter what we're doing. And so for me, mindfulness has been a practice that's helped me to stay in that space to not ruminate on the past, not get too forward thinking, but to be fully present with the people and spaces and the opportunities that I have. And so I think that's my encouragement I leave to people is just think about how mindfulness can shape not just your work, but also your personal lives as well. Mm -hmm. Um, And so folks can find me. I'm connected to Mindful Momentum. Um, And so if they just search for Mindful Momentum out there, we're doing some great work around not just mindfulness uh, for leaders, but for students and for people in their everyday lives. So looking for us at mindful-momentum.com and you can get more information about the Engaged Leader Program that we've developed 
as well as a lot of the other resources that the folks at uh, Mindful Momentum are helping to push out into our world to help all people be their best selves. Mm -hmm. And whether you're looking to be more mindful or if you're looking for the next step in your elevation to be leaders, Robin Wilson is going to be able to help you get there, whether it be through her programs, through her coaching, or just through this podcast or her, her words that you probably hear out in the world, you're going to be in good hands. So everyone, I encourage you to check out all her information it will be in the description box below. So check it out at your earliest convenience. And I want to thank you so much, Robin, for coming on, spending your time with me. It's been a huge pleasure. Thank you so much. Thanks for inviting me and I've enjoyed talking with you. Again, another huge thank you to my guest, Robin Wilson, for coming on Coaching in Session. So much words of wisdom, so many years of expertise in the field of teaching, and then being able to relay that to other teachers. One of the things that I aim to do some point in my life is to go to a college, go to my old college, and then speak to those new students who are coming to be teachers. Because what I have learned over the years is that having that type of mentor, having that person who has already been through the gauntlet, it was so insightful. It was so eye-opening. And then you can also see those teachers, how full they were still, even though they were maybe gray hair, maybe going bald, maybe wrinkles. None of that mattered. Their energy was so vibrant. Their color was more than just someone who did a job for X, Y, Z amount of years. You can tell that their life had meaning. And I knew what I wanted to do was I wanted to create some type of meaning just like they did. And having that type of leadership come and speak to you or just help you understand, hey, let's be more mindful. Let's be more aware. There's so much more to that. So again, everyone check out Robin Wilson. Make sure to share this video and your audio podcast with as many people as you can, especially teachers. Share it with your teaching community, with your principals, with your district, and just getting to the realm of, yes, we are appreciated. Yes, we understand this job is not easy, but the end result is going to be students who are going to be thankful that they had you as a teacher or had you as a mentor because you essentially are the building blocks for the whole entire future. So let's make sure those blocks that we give them are going to be strong and meaningful so they can create strong and meaningful lives. My name is Michael Reardon. I'm a mindset coach. If you have any questions, you can email me coaching in session at gmail.com. I will see everyone on the next episode of coaching in session. Until then, everyone take care.